Well, hello there. Welcome to season four, episode 34 of the Still Becoming podcast. I'm truly glad you're here. Now, today's episode is going to be slightly different. It is the third of three episodes I've been bringing to you about how we walk as Christians in a culture that is politically polarizing, hateful, difficult, and quite honestly works against us as believers. Now, Jesus walked in a very similar culture, and he shows us how in the pages of scripture. And today I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different things, but one subject that I am going to touch on and I really want to give you a warning about is I am going to talk about abortion. Now, if that's a subject that is hurtful and harmful to you, then please, please feel free to just click off and, you know, go listen to somebody else's podcast or another episode of mine. But if you are looking for grace and truth and love, then I ask you to stick with me because you'll find that in this episode. Also, I want to let you know that I just felt like I wanted to bring this episode to you in its purest form. I'm not going to add uh, an advertisement for my coaching business in the middle. I'm not going to have a lot of bells and whistles at the end. I just want to bring it to you because it is really something that just kind of bubbled up in me from the Holy Spirit, and I just feel compelled to just bring it to you. So I hope it is a blessing. I hope that it helps you discern not only your own language, as I've had to discern and look at mine, but also the people that you hang with, the people who you listen to, the people who shape your thinking. So again, I hope it's a blessing to you. I hope that you enjoy this simpler episode of the Still Becoming podcast. Hi there, friends. Welcome to the Still Becoming podcast, a place where women like you and me find help to move from where you are to where you want to be. I'm your host, Laura Acuna. The Still Becoming podcast is where we gather to rethink our thinking about ourselves, our lives, and about our God. We will learn to reframe our shame and trade in limiting beliefs for the liberating truth from God's Word. And why the title Still Becoming? Because that's the Christian journey, isn't it? As we apply God's perfect Word to our lives for growth and change, we are always growing, always learning, and still becoming the women he created us to be. It's never perfect, and it's not too late. Do I need to say that again? It is never perfect, and it is not too late. I am so glad you're here for the journey, and I'm praying that God will speak directly to you through today's episode. Are you ready? Let's go. So let's start with a familiar scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 13, and it is the famous wedding verse. And did you know that this verse is not for weddings? Paul did not write this to talk to two people who were getting married, although it applies for sure. But Paul is talking about how we get along with each other. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these Three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these 
is love. It really does change the view, I think, of this very familiar verse when we understand the audience that it was written for. It was for us and how we're supposed to get along and how we're supposed to quite honestly behave as believers in the body of Christ and out toward the world. So in this episode, we're going to talk about three parts of this verse. We're going to talk about verse four that says, love is patient and love is kind. We're going to talk about putting away childish thinking and reasoning. And we're going to talk about verse five, love does not dishonor others. And the point of all of this today, girls, is for us to take the temperature of where we are right now with all of that in a culture that wants to pull us in so many different directions. And then also, I just want to hold out that you're allowed to be a fruit inspector. You're allowed to look at a tree and discern what kind of fruit it's bearing. And you can use this verse, among many others, to discern, to discern. That's not being judgy. That's discerning who you listen to, who is shaping your thinking, who are you talking to, where do you go to for your information. You can be a fruit inspector. So let's talk about the power of patience. It goes way beyond waiting. Now, we all know the saying, patience is a virtue. My mother and my grandmother used to say that to me all the time. But the Bible unveils a deeper meaning in 1 Corinthians 13. Here, Paul describes a patience that's not just about waiting, but about maturity, one of my favorite words. The Greek word for patient refers to our interactions with others. It's the strength to be understanding and forgiving even when we could retaliate. It's a compassionate love that avoids public shaming or belittling others. Look, we've all acted impulsively without considering the impact of our actions or our words. And the Bible reminds us as we mature, we're to leave those childish ways behind. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Our world, especially now, craves leaders, political figures, pastors, people within the body of Christ who embody this mature love, patience, and kindness. It's a call for a more compassionate and understanding approach. And of course, we're all human. Perfection is never the goal. But by actively applying the Bible's teachings, we can strive to leave childishness in our behavior, our words, and our attitudes behind. Ephesians 4.15 reminds us that speaking the truth with love allows us to grow closer to Christ the ultimate model of humility. How we approach people who are far from God, who are hurting, who don't have the security that we have matters. The words that we use really, really matter. And the example of how to use our words comes from none other than Jesus himself. It makes me think of a situation I found myself in a few years ago when I attended a documentary on the life of Abby Johnson. Now, you may or may not know who Abby Johnson is, but she was a significant leader in the Planned Parenthood organization. She had two abortions herself while she worked for them. And through a series of dramatic events, she came to Christ. And it's one of those stories that is so hard to watch in the beginning, but so glorious at the end, which is so, so like God, isn't it? So many God stories are hard to watch at the beginning, but glorious to watch at the end. And this documentary preceded a full film that was done on Abby's life called Unplanned. I think that was the name of it. I'll put the link in the show notes. But anyway, went to the documentary, learned all about Abby's life. And afterwards, there was a time of discussion in the group that I was with, and it was men and women. And a man stood up, a brother in Christ stood up, and he referred to women who have had abortions as murderers. Now, let me pause here and say, I never know, I couldn't possibly know who is listening to this episode. So if this just triggered you because of your own story, I am so sorry, but please hang with me because there's grace at the end and it's coming from Jesus directly to you. Now, when this brother in Christ stood up and said this, there was kind of a shudder in the room. And that's because in any group of people, there are going to be women who have this as part of their story. And I remember one woman, actually, I believe she was the women's ministry leader of the church, 
She stood up and she said, don't ever, ever, ever use that language toward a woman who has had an abortion. Now, let me make this clear. I have been pro-life my entire life. There has never been a moment that I haven't fully understood that life begins at conception and that two lives are impacted when there is an abortion and one of those lives dies. I understand it's a choice. I understand it all. But the other thing that I understand is how Jesus encountered sinners and how he treated them, particularly women. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Now, I wish that that was the first time and only time that I'd heard that word leveled at women who have had abortions, but that would be lying because I heard it my whole life. I heard it then. I've had women come to me when I've spoken at retreats sobbing because they finally got their nerve up to tell a circle of sisters in a Bible study at a former church about their abortion, and somebody in the circle used those words against her. But let me read to you from John 8. This is beginning at verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people had gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. A couple of things here. It was the religious people who caused the stir and shamed her by dragging her out in front of the people and in front of Jesus. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when Jesus says the famous, let he who is without sin throw the first stone, scripture tells us that they started to go away, but the older ones went first. That is a significant part of the scripture. You've probably heard me talk about this before, because they're right there shows us that the mature set the example. And then, does Jesus call her by the derogatory names that we in our society call women who are caught in adultery? No, no. He calls her woman, which is an endearing and intimate term. And then he sets her on her feet and he tells her the truth in love and sends her on her way. This is it right here. This is it. In all the years that I have served women in so many different ways, I've sat quietly with women who share with me their broken stories, abortion, addiction, adultery, all kinds of things that we human beings can get ourselves into. I've watched women come to Christ, have their lives changed, and be set free from the guilt and the shame of past choices. It has happened to me as well. And every single time we come to Christ for healing, for forgiveness, for freedom, for love, for understanding, we come because of the kindness. Words like the one these people used, derogatory name calling, that is so prevalent in our culture right now. It sends people into the dark with their hands over their heads, cowering in a fetal position where extending a hand and trying to understand where someone else is coming from and extending God's love to them, modeling Jesus as best we can as imperfect human beings, draws them out into the light with their faces radiant when they discover they're forgiven. If you've had any time at all to listen to episodes 32 and 33 of the podcast, you know that my already passionate feelings about spiritual maturity and emotional health have kind of bubbled up even stronger 
because of the 2024 election year where there's just so much going on. It's so easy for us to forget who we are and to forget Jesus's example when we feel righteous, when we feel angry over something, when we see blatant sin, when laws and things are being changed and they go against the word of God. But we must never, ever, ever resort to name calling when we're upset. That is not the way of Jesus. We will never be as perfect as he is, but we're supposed to be sanctified, which is a churchy word for becoming more like him as we go along the way. And so I want that for myself. I'm not there yet. And I want that for you. And that's why I've been bringing these episodes to you. I feel so strongly that our strongest witness is love first, grace first, and truth spoken in a way that has the right posture of wanting to save someone from hurt and disaster, not to condemn, not to shame, not to send cowering back into the dark, but to bring them out into the light. So I'm going to end with a scripture, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23 from the message. And it's, it's kind of casual considering the conversation that we've just had, but I like it. It's Paul. And I think it's a fitting way to end what we've been talking about. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, in the message. Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immortalists, that's a mouthful, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't want to just talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. I want to be in on it too. Amen and amen. Well, friends, that's it for today. Thank you so much for coming by. My prayer is that you'll leave this episode pondering and praying and thinking about the love verses from Corinthians and what audience Paul was actually writing those words to. Hint, it's us. And thinking about what that word patient, love is patient, means for you in your interaction with other people. Thinking about how words can dishonor people and that scripture actually talks about Our tongue can bring life or death to a situation. Of course, we want to bring life. Thinking about what childish things I might need to lay down. Where am I reasoning and still thinking in an immature way? And then finally, be a fruit inspector. That advice was given to me long ago. I was so tangled up about being judgy about something. And an older, wiser sister said to me, Laura, be a fruit inspector. You are given permission by God in the scriptures to judge a tree by the fruit it bears. If you don't see good fruit on a tree, don't vote for it, don't hang with it, and don't listen to it. Move on. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. That's a good word to end on today. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. I'll see you next time on the Still Becoming Podcast.